Welcome back, everyone, to Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer. Thank you for tuning in once again today. We have a very special guest following up after our interview nine months ago, hard to believe, with delegate now delegate Eric Zare. Last time we followed up with him, it was in July. He was campaigning for the House of Delegates, and now he has been in the House of Delegates. He still is, but his legislative session's over. We're going to talk to him about it. You have to pardon my voice, recovering from an illness and a bunch of allergies. So let's get into it today. You're going to enjoy this episode on Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer. America is no longer one nation under God. Are you ready to fight for revival? Well, then you've come to the right place. Welcome to Fight and Revive with Adam Boyer. Delegate Zare, thank you for joining us again on the show. Adam, it's a pleasure to be here. And I guess the fact that I'm here a second time means I didn't tank your ratings too badly you did not. nine months ago. No, you actually helped tremendously. So wow. thank you for that. Having someone with your fame and notoriety. Right, yeah. right, right. So last time we talked was back in July. <clears throat> the episode actually got released on Independence Day, fittingly, July 4th. So last time we left off, you about halfway through your campaign. You had the whole headline about you running against the Democrat and the independent incumbent. So tell us how all that shook out and how the campaign went. Looking back, I can see we, in July, did not know what was happening in terms of the campaign, in terms of that independent. We didn't know how hard the Democrats were going to push and how much money they were going to put into it. So we, from February, January or February, when we launched that campaign, we were full steam ahead through the entirety. Never let off. I was at every event that I could be at. We had great support fundraising. We had great ground support, grassroots people uh, really just getting involved. And we ended up winning that race with over 70% of the vote. So a very, uh, very confirming election last year. Good to hear. So as you traveled around the district, I know you did a lot of door knocking, a lot of signs. Um, I got to be a small part of the campaign, so I'm very glad for that. It was a fun campaign. Um, what did you find that the voters of House District 51, what were they most concerned about? Uh, most, in, I could summarize people's concerns with the term limited government. People really want to know that they, they've got an advocate who's going to keep government out of their lives, but also one who's going to stand up and support life. Uh, you know, I'm a believer that life begins at conception, that every baby um, is a life that God creates uh, from conception and that those are people who need the protection of the state. But also I kept hearing over and over, people want to know that the state is going to stop <coughs> trying to own their children. So there's this societal, it seems like societal push, but it's really not. It's it's a few extremists who are behind this whole thing to get parents pushed to the side so that they can push their agenda in, in the way of education, um, using our schools, using other uh, state-sponsored avenues to promote things like you know, transgendering, um, to promote things like critical race theory, which boils down to Marxism. So there's really a push to upend society by hijacking our school system, by hijacking the, the avenues that we've already got in place, and parents want to know that there's somebody who's going to advocate for them to keep them in charge of their children's education and uh, to push back against this nonsense that says that men can be women and vice versa and, and you know, literally cutting parts off children who then grow up to regret what's happened, um, you know, this is some of the worst forms of child abuse that we're seeing. Yeah, there's been recently a couple big cases of finally these kids, you know, they, they were raised in the mid-2010s or whatever, and they've grown up and they're adults now. And they have, you know, they want to go through the detransition process, as they call it, which can't ever be completely undone. But there's been a lot of that and a couple recently big stories of um, them end up, they end up suing the doctors and the medical establishment that that didn't you know basically stop them from doing this when they were 14 or 15 or however old and so those cases are all, cases are all still pending as far as i know there'll probably be several years of litigation um so obviously this year the house was controlled i believe 51 49 democrat and the senate was 21 19 republican 
I think it's 2119 Democrat. Democrat. So each chamber, barely a Democrat majority, but I think what a lot of people don't realize is it's not just a majority. It's great to have it by more than one vote, but often all you need is one vote because then you still control the committees and the subcommittees and yep. all that. And you have your, that's where most good bills get killed, if not before. So in the Democrat controlled legislature, did you see any legislation get to be advanced this year to that effect of parental rights, so to speak? So going back, <clears throat> Adam, I want to touch on something you just mentioned, and that is that one vote, the, the one extra vote that the Democrats have gives them the control of who sits on every committee. So every committee then is stacked with Democrats. So there is nothing that Republicans can do on committee. Democrats decide even which legislation comes out. Um, Democrats really control about everything. And so that agenda that they wanted to see pushed, which undermines the traditional values, traditional family values that um, I'm going to say that America was founded on, that we've gotten used to being able to take for granted, uh, they were <clears throat> able to really push hard and, um, and undermine a lot of that. So with that being the case, I'm guessing probably wasn't a lot of legislation y'all really could get out to that effect. So Republicans could not, could not get anything through that Democrats did not want through. That doesn't mean that we didn't get anything done. There's a great value because we have a Republican governor. There was a great value in being able to put up a lot of Republican no votes, which then gave the governor cover to veto some of the worst of those bills. So there was value in that, but we were also able to get some legislation through. One thing that I learned was how to take a good bill and speak a different language to get Democrat support for it. So we're used to certain words in our conservative realm. We think in terms of freedom. We think in terms of limited government. We think in terms of law and order. Democrats think in an entirely different way. They're using an entirely different set of words. So I had one bill that, that passed. The governor just signed it. It was it's a, an incredibly helpful bill, which enables the sheriff to obtain cellular records in cases where somebody has gone missing <clears throat> under suspicious circumstances. So now the sheriff can take evidence to the judge and the judge can determine if there's enough evidence there to warrant giving the sheriff permission to look at that person's cellular records. Well, I started out promoting this bill as it was helpful to law enforcement. Speaking that language would have killed this bill <clears throat> because that's not what Democrats want. They do not want bills coming through that are assisting law enforcement. They had a lot of bills um, that were pro-criminals. They had a lot of bills that were uh, a pro-prison reform and so on. And, and some of that is good, but it was almost exclusively slanted on the side of the, the criminal. So back to your question of were we able to get anything done? Yes, we were able to get some things done. That bill, instead of me promoting it as a, a pro-law enforcement bill, I promoted it as a bill that um, helps a disenfranchised group of people access services from the sheriff's department. So I used words that the other side is used to hearing, and that truthfully was what this was about because... Wow. You had a group of people, i.e. any who were not um, mentally handicapped, could not receive these services from the sheriff's department. So now that group, we all can benefit from that service. Uh, had another bill, which was an acupuncture bill. It specified a, a certain acupuncture protocol that was previously unavailable except to a select group of people i.e. people with great medical insurance, that protocol is now available to a wider range of patients for the treatment of trauma. So it's, it's a very low cost, no drug treatment that's been proven helpful uh, with de in dealing with trauma. And now that's going to be more widely available. Okay, gotcha. 
so yeah, that that's very interesting. I wouldn't think that would actually work, but it did <laughs> in this case. Yeah. Now I had a lot of other bills that literally didn't even make it on the docket. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that's interesting. I know you had some of your uh, flagship legislation that wasn't able to get anywhere just because you're a conservative. Not only are you a Republican, you're a conservative. Um, so that wasn't going to go anywhere. Not this year anyway. Um, I'm interested to hear what do you think were some of and either some of the worst bills that came out that were passed or some of the worst bills, period, that just most of them got vetoed. But either way, which ones? One of the worst ones that passed was um, the, the bill that uh, hikes up the minimum wage, which you know, we heard story after story, evidence after evidence of how damaging that was going to be to small businesses, especially to small businesses, but also to the consumer because um, no longer can... I, as an individual, go to a business and, and exchange freely, but the government's dictating the terms of that exchange and saying you're going to have to pay X amount per hour, which really cuts the legs off anybody who's trying to enter the labor market. Because somebody who, say, um, they're a high schooler, they have no skills, they're just looking for that job experience, they just want to get in, they don't have a lot to offer but they do have some time. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. A lot of them are not going to be able to find employment now because of a law like this. Um, a lot of talk about inflation. We, we dealt in depth with the effects that, I think it's like we're pushing 40% is the increase in groceries over the past four years. Yep. Nobody's making 40% more, but we're paying 40% more. So there's a really interesting story where one of the delegates brought a can of Jif peanut butter out to the floor one day. And he <coughs> told how he had just come from the store paying $7 for this jar of peanut butter. The point he was making was that just a few years ago, he was able to get that same peanut butter for under $4. Now $7. It wasn't a day or two later, one of the Democrats came back with a jar of great value peanut butter and said look you can still get peanut butter for four dollars what's the problem here <laughs> completely missing the point the point being it's harder for people to put food on the table now because of inflation therefore let's keep taxes down democrat it just flew right over their head they just don't get it and it seems like a lot of these Democrats coming from Northern Virginia, where it's, you know, money seems to flow pretty easily, they're disconnected from how food is produced and put on the table. It's meaningless to them. It's just a few more dollars per item, big deal. So uh, that is a big deal to the rest of us. And that's something that we've got to continue to advocate for is keeping prices low, keeping taxes low make it easier for families at home. Yeah, I've been reliably informed that Bidenomics is indeed working. And <laughs> the, the number that they usually cite for that is that the jobs report is way up, they say. A couple of caveats, of course, that being that they were all the jobs that we've gotten are recovered from about December of 2019, roughly. Um, they're almost all recovered jobs, not gain jobs. They are mostly part-time jobs, not full-time jobs. And the vast majority of them are going to illegal immigrants. So those are a couple of statistics I like to throw out that don't usually make uh, the people I'm debating with, whether that be in a comment section that I post or on my video, they don't usually like those uh, numbers. There's, there's a saying that you know, li figures don't lie, but liars do figure. And, <laughs> and so you use those sort of um, surveys and, and polls, you can prove anything you want. But yeah. you need, like you, you did, you have to look beneath the surface. Yeah. Yeah, there's, all, there's always a poll to prove your side or a study if you look hard enough. Yeah. Um, I'd be interested to hear. So, well, I'll ask two questions first. I'll ask this one first. What do you think was in the Republi you know, Democrat-controlled legislature, Republican minority, but with the Republican governor, like you said, Governor Yunkin, what do you think was, the, in your opinion, the best bill to come out of the legislature this year? Who the best bill? <laughs> one of them that, I, that stands out in my mind that I really liked, and it, you know, I'd have to think through, was it the best bill or not? Maybe not, but it was a bill that came through the Transportation Committee. No, 
I think I saw it both in transportation and education, giving school boards greater autonomy. Okay, everybody, hope you're enjoying the Eric Zare interview. This is the part where I interrupt for about 10 seconds to ask you real quick to subscribe to the channel to help us reach more people and spread our conservative message. When it comes to how to transport students. And in other words, this bill would allow the school board to hire somebody to drive their personal car 30 miles out to get that one student rather than sending a $100,000 school bus to get one student. So it gives greater autonomy. And I thought that's a, an example of the sorts of things we need to be looking for is how can we work more efficiently? Taking the approach that a small business owner would <clears throat> to the government sector and thinking for thinking in terms of what's efficient, what can be done that may be outside of the box, unorthodox, but it makes good sense. So that was one of my favorites. I think so often we hear like so many, so t often, especially in the national level of politics, but really on all levels of the like, the, the issues we argue for, the Democrats will say, you know, that top 1% is just got to be taxed, you know, 5% heavier or whatever. No one actually truly cares. The bills that get overlooked the most often, you won't get media coverage because it doesn't make a big splash. But it's something like that, that actually has a tangible, uh, got a noticeable effect on the community. And they're like, oh, you know, this didn't used to be the, ch the case. That must have changed at some point. They may not think about it any deeper than that, but they might also find out when it changed. And those are the type of things that people really care about, um, especially on the local level, I think. Um, so keeping on the topic of the legislature this year, what was when you're campaigning, you know, you've never been to Richmond before, not in that sense anyway. You kind of don't have no exactly, you know, you got to get trained a couple weeks ahead of time. Basically, what was a lot? What was the thing you thought was really noticed was really different than you expected when you're campaigning versus reality? I would say it was the vast difference in worldviews between the two groups. I've seen on TV people who advocate for the sorts of things we were talking about earlier, the transgendering and, and the, the Marxism. And I thought those are just TV examples, but no, I dealt with them day in and day out in the General Assembly right here in Virginia. And so I got to see firsthand the effects of every vote. Because going back to that one extra Democrat gives the Democrats complete control of the legislature. But some of those Democrats were put in by razor thin margins on election day. Um, I can think of one district that was um, determined by, I think it was 53 or 54 votes. Yeah. I think it was three or three, somewhere between three and five of those marginal districts were determined by 1,800 votes all put together. 1,800 votes spread over multiple districts at the state level is so thin, it's, it's just incredible. So we have recounts going on and, um, Every vote mattered. So yes. had we one more Republican in either the House or the Senate, it would be a completely different game today. I'll ask you this because this is not something I tend to ask, but I just thought about it because you mentioned that one more vote in the Senate would have given us a 2020 tie and Lieutenant Governor Winsome Sears breaks the tie. If there's a 50-50 floor vote in the House and it's tied, what happens? What happens is both parties have to work together. <clears throat> Uh-oh. But the way it works right now, with the Democrats having one vote more in each chamber, they can ram through whatever they want. Right. So if one of their it would, one of their guys would have to flip for it to be a fifty fifty vote, and, and none of their right people back. are going to flip. No. It's, and if it does, too much flip back. There. Yeah. yeah. Okay. No. Interesting. So um, this is something. It's not directly tied to the legislature. Um, it's only just now starting to be floated with Nebraska and the news and all that. But I'm not sure if it would take an act of the legislature or a congressional amendment or both. But ne currently, Nebraska and Maine are the only two states where their electoral votes aren't decided just as the entire state, how the state votes, there goes their electoral votes. So if 50% plus one of their members votes Democrat, all their congressional votes go to the Democrat nominee. <clears throat> Excuse me. So uh, Nebraska is like that as well. Or, all the other states are like that except Maine and Nebraska. Maine and Nebraska split their electoral votes 
by district, by congressional district. So, for example, in Nebraska, it has four electoral votes. Their first and third district always go Republican. The state as a whole always goes Republican. But District 2, which is where Omaha is located, usually goes by about two to three points Democrat. So usually Nebraska's three of their four electoral votes go Republican. Maine, it's the exact opposite, except they have two congressional districts. The number one is much more rural. It's more, uh, it's the northern part of Maine. Number, uh, second congressional district is urban, and it always goes Democrat. There's more population in there. So it's the one congressional vote from that blue district, plus the state as a whole goes blue. So the Maine gets two of their three electoral votes go Democrat. Virginia, as recently really as the 80s and 90s, was a deep red state. Even through the early 2000s, there still was a lot of red with it. It was more of a split uh, uh, swing state at that point. Um, in recent years, uh, very largely due to the influence of Washington, D.C. and Maryland uh, on Nova, uh, Virginia has shifted where it's now a tilt to lean to likely blue, depending on who you ask. I kind of have it as a lean blue state myself, three to four to five point dim. And it depends on the election year. Um, Dems were doing really well for the past decade until 2021. We took the governorship, the statewide offices, and House of Delegates. Um, 2023, last year, they gained ground. They lost one seat in the Senate, but they had a two-seat majority, so they've still held on in the Senate. And then they retook the House, flipping three seats. So Virginia is still sort of a swing state, but not really. It's definitely going more blue. All that said, to set up the question, do you like the idea of Virginia becoming a split electoral vote state? Right now, there's a couple swing districts, but for the most part, you can generally count on Virginia, 11 congressional districts. Six of them will go blue generally. Four to five will go red, which would split our electoral votes. What do you think about that? Okay, everybody, we are going to go ahead and cut off part one of the Eric Zare interview there. If we don't do it now, it's going to start being a really long video. So I do hope you enjoyed. If you did, go ahead and help us in the algorithm by watching some more interviews and episodes on the channel. Thanks so much for watching this one.